ahead of time for everything that you're going to be doing in and through us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Welcome to River Bend. If we haven't got a chance to meet yet, my name is Ben. Get to serve as one of the pastors here at the church. I'm so glad to be able to worship with you, whether you're with us in the room downstairs in the theater or worshiping with us online. Um, Pastor Joe had the opportunity to go uh, back down to South Georgia to preach at the church that he first served as student pastor in. So um, we have been praying for him, praying for Courtney, praying for that church. Um, And then I know that he's excited about being back here next week with us. So um, I'm glad to be able to fill in for him as we close out this series. If you've been with us throughout this series, um, uh, we have been going through a series called Elephant and My Family. And uh, whether you're with us, whether you call Riverbend home or you're just new to the series, um, let me kind of give you a synopsis of the series and kind of bring everybody up uh, to speed on it. Elephants are things that everyone sees, but nobody wants to say. Nobody wants to talk about it. So if you've been a part of Riverbend Church for any amount of time, you know that if there's things that we sense that everybody sees, but nobody wants to talk about, guess what? We're going to talk about it. Um, And especially when the Bible speaks into those things. Um, So we've also talked about these elephants in our families. They actually have the potential, if we leave them unaddressed, they actually have the potential to wreck the mission and the purpose and the joy and the contentment of our families. So we definitely want to allow the Word of God to speak into these elephants. And if you're with us all the way back, this is the sixth and final leg of this series, but if you're with us all the way back five weeks ago, Pastor Joe, he walked through the springboard uh, passage or verse that we've been operating off of is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And the writer of Hebrews wrote, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And in this passage, we see two things that have kind of teed up the template of where we've been going over the course of the series. Number one, we have weights that slow us down, and then we have sins that so easily trip us up. So there are two types of elephants that we've been discussing. The weights that slow us down are not necessarily sins. They're tensions in our lives in our lives that we are called to acknowledge but then apply biblical principles to. The sins uh, that so easily trip us up, those are sins or those are problems that God is calling us to confess to him and to seek forgiveness. And then through the power of the Holy Spirit, God can actually bring healing to these elephants in our lives. Uh, Through the power and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, God can actually kick these elephants out of our home. So we've been going over the past five weeks. Pastor Joe's been leading us. We've been talking about things like the elephant of unchecked emotions. We've been talking about uh, stewardship, how if we're not uh, stewards, if we don't see ourselves as stewards of what God has given us in our time and our treasure um, and and our talents, um, then we see ourselves as owners. And if we see ourselves as owners, Uh, that is going to give the elephant in our family, that's going to give it fertile room for that thing to grow in our family. We've talked about um, withholding good. Like uh, last week, Pastor Joe talked about that if we withhold good from someone, that's the same as withholding God from someone. And he he unpacked all the various reasons that we uh, withhold good and the ways that we withhold good. So if you've been with us throughout the entire series, I'm just kind of bringing us all up to speed. If you're new to the series or you had to miss a couple weeks, I would highly encourage you to go back through the archives and watch or listen to these series because I know they've been personally very beneficial to me, and I know that they can be very helpful for you. You can find them on Facebook, YouTube, or even, uh, as Preston mentioned earlier, our sermon podcast. And uh, you can get the sermon podcast either through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere that you find a podcast, just type in Riverbend Church. You'll find our logo and click on it, and then you'll be all brought up to speed. But regardless of these elephants, we've come to the realization and the acknowledgement that the elephants in our our families, the elephants in our lives, the elephant in the room, they never stay small, they never stay the same, they never stay confined to just one room or category of our lives, they eventually take over our entire lives, and the more or the longer we leave them unaddressed, the more uh, havoc they're going to wreak on our lives and then the lives of those around us, and especially in our families. This morning, we're going to be talking about the last elephant, and I think that this elephant is potentially the most common. I think it's probably the sneakiest and flies under the radar 
So it makes it one of the most destructive elephants, and it is the elephant of unmet expectations. It's the elephant of unmet expectations. Now, I don't think there's a single one of us, whether you're in the theater or upstairs with us uh, in the room or uh, worshiping with us online, that you would say, hey, listen, I gotta be honest with you, life has turned out exactly how I thought it was gonna turn out, around every twist and turn. I think that we have that in common. Like, there's none of us that life has turned out exactly, has gone exactly to our script. So I remember, let me just kind of take an informal poll kind of off script here. Um, does anybody in here, can anybody go through like the name of all your teachers that you had like all through elementary school, like growing up? Like, I don't know why, but they still st- stick ingrained in my head. Like in second grade, I had a teacher named Miss Boyd, and I was a pretty good kid. Um, but I remember Miss Boyd always got checks on my card because that was like the big bad, like, hey, that's going to go on your permanent record. Um, as, a, as a second grader, I got checks on my card because I accidentally, and I promise you, it was accidentally, always reversed the last two letters of her last name. So instead of writing Miss Boyd, I wrote Miss Body. I really didn't mean to as a second grader, but the older I got, the funnier that got. Um, <laughs> but I promise I didn't mean to at all. And like, I remember just crying and like sniffling uh, when I got a check on my card, she would give me my work back. And like, not only did I not get all the problems right on my worksheet, but like she gave me a check on my card for misspelling her name again. And I was like, sorry. Um, but I remember one of my favorite classes or one of my favorite teachers of all time was Miss Gillespie. Miss Gillespie was my fifth grade teacher at J.G. Dyer Elementary. Shout out uh, Dragons of J.G. Dyer. Um, they built this school, no joke. It's relocated now. They built it across from the county jail. Um, so every six weeks, we would have a hard lockdown because some guy that cheated on his taxes decided to jump the fence. Um, not really good long-term planning, but hey, we had a good childhood. So uh, anyway, fifth grade, J.G. Dyer Elementary, Miss Gillespie's class. I remember three things vividly about Miss Gillespie's class. Number one, that was the class that science started to get a lot harder. Up until that point, I got like a smiley face or a check, point, uh, check mark in science. And then after Miss Gillespie's science class, like starting in fifth grade all the way forward, I like prayed to God and praised God for getting an A in science. So I remember science started to get harder. I also remember that um, after we came back from Christmas in Miss Gillespie's class, she told us that um, we no longer had to write in cursive. Apparently, Miss Gillespie had like personal revival in her life, and she, uh, she like poured out the blessings of God on her fifth grade class and said, you no longer have to write in cursive. So from that point on, I've never written in cursive again. Thank you, Ms. Gillespie. But the third thing that I remember about Ms. Gillespie's class is there was one day that our guidance counselor comes in and she gives us an aptitude test. You know what an aptitude test is? It's where you have this packet of information, you give it to a person and it has a bunch of questions. You fill out the questions based on your own personal personal preferences and then you you start adding up the numbers and then based on the answers that you give to the questions that it asks, it spits out what it believes to be your best career path moving forward. Anybody interested in know what it came back as for me? It was a tie between two things. If I'm lying, I'm dying, no joke. Bulldozer operator and crossing guard. It was a tie for those two things. <laughs> and if I'm being really super honest with you this morning, there are a lot of days that I'm not really sure if I've underachieved or overachieved uh, that aptitude <laughs> test. But when we're talking about unmet expectations, we're not talking about like, you know, been living out his fifth grade dreams here. And I'm not talking about you living out your fifth grade dreams or, or things working out the way that you thought they would go in fifth grade. We're talking about something so much bigger, so much larger, so much deeper than like what we thought, how life would, would, uh, would pan out when we were in fifth grade. Let me give you a good working definition. This is in your notes. The elephant of unmet, uh, unmet expectations is when life hasn't panned out how you planned out. When life hasn't panned out how you planned out. That's the elephant of unmet expectations. When life hasn't panned out how you planned out. Let me kind of unpack that thought for just a second. The elephant of unmet expectation, uh, unmet expectations begins to manifest itself in our lives when we allow our current disappointments based on our past expectations. So the gap between what we're experiencing versus what we thought we would experience. When we allow our current disappointments based on our past expectations to rob today of its joy and contentment and to rob tomorrow of its hope and purpose. That's the elephant of unmet expectations. 
when life hasn't panned out how you planned out. Let me put some feet on it, and let's get like really, really personal real quick in here. If you're single in here, let me tell you how the elephant of unmet expectations can easily gain a foothold in your life. If you're single, you may have thought and even expected that you would either be married or remarried by now, but because you are currently single, this elephant of unmet expectations is starting to take, a, take, take, take root in your life and starting to grow in your life. And because your current experience is so far away from your past expectations, you're starting to feel this elephant of, expectation, of unmet expectations is causing you to feel maybe lesser than or maybe because you're single, a little trapped relationally, trapped in that relational status. Or how about this? Look back over your life, or when you look back over your life, you very well may have thought and expected that you'd be much further along in your career by now, or much more fulfilled in your career by now. And the fact is, vocationally, life hasn't panned out how you planned out so this elephant of unmet expectations has creeped in and it starts to grow. So now you're starting to feel a sense of purposeless, purposelessness and even a little hopelessness hanging over your life. Or how about this one, financially? As you look back over your life, those past expectations versus the distance between past expectations and current realities, you thought that you would be much more financially secure by now. But when you pull up your banking app on your phone and you expect to see like you would love to see, you thought that you would see a lot more zeros behind those initial numbers, that elephant of unmet expectations starts to creep in and it starts to make you feel insecure and it even starts to make you feel a little inferior to the people around you. You see, there, we could go on and on and on about specifics of unmet expectations. But this is what we're talking about. And these are all examples of how this elephant can wreak havoc on our lives. But this isn't in your notes, but it's really important for us to understand. Most of the time, our, un, our unmet expectations are most often unspoken expectations. Just because something isn't spoken out loud or written down in a journal doesn't mean that it's not real. As a matter of fact, I think the majority of our Unmet expectations are often unspoken expectations. But even though they're unspoken, it doesn't mean that they're unknown to God. You see, I think what makes this elephant different from any of the other elephants that we've talked about so far is because this elephant, the elephant of unmet expectations, simultaneously strikes at our minds and distorts our perspective of everything that we see around us while also striking at our heart, stealing and sucking out the joy. That's the danger of this elephant of unmet expectations. So what I want to do this morning in our time together is I want to pull back the curtain and shed some light on the triggers of what triggers this elephant in our lives. But I want to go ahead and just throw this out here beforehand that what we're about to talk about, the triggers or the sources of unmet expectations they're, they're actually going to be a deeper reason and a deeper root down to the core that we're going to go through in just a moment. But let's go through some sources. And I wrote in your notes, there's three major sources, I think, or we can say sources or we can say triggers of unmet expectations. Number one, comparison to others. Comparisons to others. This trigger, what triggers this elephant when it comes to the comparison of others is what we see going on around us. You can make an argument that this has probably been the most common trigger like throughout history, but especially in 2021, this uh, comparison to others is wreaking havoc on our hearts, on our minds, and on our lives. And it's absolutely distorting our perspective while sucking out our joy. And here's why I say that, is with the rise and the prominence and dominance of social media, we see so much more about other people, yet we know them so much less, right? So you can scroll through your social media feed, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and you can sit there and go, man, there they go, they're on another vacation. You can see a person on an incredible vacation, or they're sitting in a nice home, or they just bought a new car, or they bought a new truck, 
or you know, you, you, you scroll past somebody that you're, you're, you're tempted to compare yourself against and she's posting a picture of her most natural laid back state, hashtag beach, care, beach hair don't care. You know, and it starts to make you feel jealous. You're like, oh man, she didn't even try. And you start to feel jealous and then that jealousy starts to morph into envy. And see, I believe without a doubt that envy is one of the most prominent sins that we deal with, yet it's also one of the least discussed sins that we deal with. Envy is fixating myself on something someone else has. And it grows and it morphs into the deception that it causes me to believe that if I just have what they have, I will be healthy and whole. And that is a silent, envy is a silent and a slow assassin. But just because envy is silent and slow, make no mistake about it, it's still an assassin nonetheless. It's such a big deal that King Solomon wrote in the book of Proverbs. Check this out. Envy will rot your bones. This like constant comparison uh, and, this, and this deception that if I just have what somebody else has, I'll be healthy and whole. That thought pattern, that way of living will rot your bones. Now, what makes it really interesting that Solomon wrote this is I'm not just talking about like Christians and biblically speaking, I'm talking historically. Any historical scholar will tell you that King Solomon was one of the wealthiest kings to have ever lived in the history of humanity. And it's this guy in that context that writes about the dangers of envy. He wanted to warn us about envy. So envy, you're not immune to envy if you're wealthy. You're not immune to envy if you're married. You're not immune to envy if you fill in the blanks of what you think that you're missing in your life that would make you healthy and whole. That doesn't make you immune to envy. Envy is a heart condition. Can I tell you a secret also about this whole thing of comparison? The only thing that you and I know about other people, this will make you paranoid towards people. I don't mean it to sound like that. The only thing that you and I know about other people is what they choose to show us. You ever found that to be true? And typically what people choose to show us is that highly filtered and highlighted, highlight real of their lives. So like the whole like... Um, Posting pictures of new house, fancy vacation, new car, new truck. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. We don't know that person. They, they may be in debt up to their eyeballs. They may be trying to fill a hole in their lives by, by buying more stuff, buying nicer stuff, bigger stuff, only to find out that once they get it, now they're deeper in debt and that hole still remains. We don't know what's going on in their lives. Like the, 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 uh, the person that you're tempted to compare yourself against that like, you know, it's just so natural and casual and carefree, you know, beach hair don't care. Um, can I tell you this? Beach hair do care. Like chances are, I don't even know if that's good grammar. Is it beach hair do care or beach hair does care? Here's what I'm getting at. You don't think that that person posted the first picture or selfie that they took of themselves, do you? So apparently, beach hair do care. Beach, yeah, beach, beach hair does care. That doesn't rhyme, but we'll go with it. What I'm getting at is like when we are so, when this elephant is triggered by comparison, what are we really triggered by? We're triggered by something that doesn't really even exist to begin with. But that's not the first trigger. That's not the only trigger. I would say that the second trigger is not just uh, comparison or the things that are going on around us. It's also regret over my past decisions. So if comparison is triggered by the things that are going on around us, regret over my past decisions is triggered, this elephant is triggered and fertilized and it grows and it's fed and it grows by the things that are going on within us. It's regret over my past decisions. Is there anybody in the room, downstairs in the theater or online, that would say, you know what, every decision that I've come up on, every crossroads that I've come up on, every choice that I've made, I made the right call. Anybody in here batting a thousand? Yeah, me neither. That means that every single person with us this morning, every single person that may like find this message like in, in, in our archives in a few weeks, every single person, we all to some degree, we have regrets, right? Now, some of those regrets, some of those are seemingly small. Some of those regrets are 
life-altering. But I think given the chance, there are many of us that we would love to have a do-over in certain decisions. Now, I'm not talking about having a do-over like going back through middle school again. Like, that's crazy. If somebody said, hey, I'll give you the chance to go back to middle school, you're like, I'll give you 20 bucks if I don't. Um, Nobody wants to go back through and repeat middle school again. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, given the chance, we're talking about like like these life-altering regrets and this guilt and the shame that we carry around. We're talking about given the chance that you may give anything, nearly anything, to be able to go back in time and not flirt with that coworker. We're talking about given the chance you would give anything to go back in time and not take that promotion so that you could spend more time with your family. We're talking about given the chance you would give almost anything to go back in time and not speak those words that became the seedbed of animosity and destruction. See, in the book of Ephesians, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote this, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. And can we just get real and honest this morning? There are a lot of us looking back over our past decisions and our past choices and our past regrets. We sit there and go, yeah, I get that. But then because I've lived, I wasn't careful how I lived and because I did live like a fool, I don't feel like I can live like someone who is wise. You see, that thought right there feeds this elephant. Because I have regrets, then I can't live in what God has called me to live. You see, there are some of us, and this is how sneaky this elephant is, this is how sneaky our enemy Satan is. There are some of us that he has already deceived into thinking that because you have regrets in your past, that you cannot, that those regrets and those decisions were so big that it thwarted and it derailed the plans that God had for your life and you are now living in essentially God's loser bracket. And that's not the gospel at all. That's not the gospel. Never wrongly assume that your past decisions have, re, have derailed God's purpose and plan for your life. So the first trigger would be comparison to others. Second trigger would be regrets in my past. This third is very real. It's circumstances completely out of my control. You see, I think that there are things that happen to us that are completely out of our control. We didn't ask for them. There's nothing that we did to cause them, and there's nothing that we can do to change them. Yet they have a profound impact on our lives. It could be a partner or a spouse or a parent that just decided to up and leave. It could be sitting in a doctor's office and you get a medical diagnosis that changes everything. It could be a layoff or a turn in the economy that you just did not see coming. It could be raising your your, your children. And when they move out, when they become older, they start to make decisions contrary to how you raised them. Whatever the specifics are, the decisions or events that seemingly change your trajectory from where you thought you were going in life to where you think that you're now heading. This is circumstances completely out of our control. You know that this is a factor. You know that this is feeding this elephant or triggering this elephant when you find yourself saying things like, if it wasn't just for that one thing in my life, everything would be different. If it wasn't just for that, if he never left, if she never left, if it wasn't for that boss or that decision, then everything would be different. Can I get very like real with you this morning? You know what? You may be right. That's right. You may be right. If it wasn't for that one thing, things might very well have been different. But never confuse being right about how your life might have been different if not for those circumstances with the belief that you have to settle for God for anything less than God's best for you. You see, these are common triggers, probably the uh, top three common triggers of this elephant. And I think before we go any further, we have to really be honest with ourselves about ourselves and sit there and go, does this elephant, does it, does it exist in my life? Does it exist in my family? And in order to make that determination, I just want to ask you a, a couple questions. When I'm talking about comparison or regret or circumstances, what's the soundtrack playing in the background of your mind? Like, when I talk about comparisons, do you automatically go to 
that person or that post and sit there and go, you know, I was just comparing myself against that, or regrets, you automatically go back to that past decision. Or circumstances completely out of your control, you automatically go to that circumstance in your mind. If you do, there's a very, very good chance that this elephant has already started to take a foothold in your life if you're completely unaware that it's there to begin with. I think more times than not, we know that this elephant exists in our lives, and we're either too proud to acknowledge it or too stubborn to deal with it this morning. Let me press in a little bit further. If we really don't think that we have an issue with comparison, have you ever found yourself scrolling through your social media feed and somebody else's success or posted success makes you feel lesser than? Are you allowing your past regrets to constrain what you think God can do in your life now? And even no doubt that you have been victimized by another person or another situation, are you still identifying as a victim? Or are you claiming the identity that you are now more than a conqueror in Christ? You see, these are all telltale signs that the elephant exists. But you know what? Whether the elephant is mainly triggered by comparison, regret, or circumstances, it's vital for us to realize that these are merely symptoms of a greater problem. You see, comparison, regret, and circumstances, those are just symptoms. Those just indicate that the elephant is there. Let's talk about the core issue. Probably the best way that I can explain it is if you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you, hey, sorry, you have the flu. You're going to have certain symptoms with the flu. You're going to have headache, body ache, maybe nausea, um, uh, you know, fever, congestion, whatever it may be. So you're going to go home and you're going to take some Tylenol, Advil, NyQuil, whatever over-the-counter medication that you, that you have to help alleviate the symptoms, right? There's nothing wrong with that. There's a lot right with that. Would highly recommend it. Like who just wants to like lay in their bed like, you know. For me, my personal medical strategy, and I'm not a doctor, so don't take my medical advice, I just drink a lot of NyQuil and go to sleep. Um, probably not the best way to handle the flu. Um, but when I take Advil and NyQuil or Tylenol, I don't take those medications thinking that it's going to cure the flu. You see, I realize those symptoms exist in my life because I have the flu. So I don't take those medicines to cure the flu. I take them to treat the symptoms. So it is with our soul. You see, the triggers and the sources of unmet expectations, it's not truly the source of our unmet expectations. I think there's something so much deeper and so much destructive at the core of our lives than these mere symptoms. And this is why following Jesus is not about behavior modification. It's about soul transformation. You know, following Jesus is going to change your behavior. But following Jesus is not about behavior modification. It's not just about doing things differently. It's about surrendering your life. It's about allowing the Holy Spirit of God himself to transform your soul. The thing that the, and only God can do that is transform your soul. So here's what I want to do. To help us examine what looks at the core, I want to look at a very well-known teaching of Jesus but in this very well-known teaching, I want to zoom way out and get a broader understanding and context of what was going on then, and that's going to help us to understand what's actually going on now with this elephant. This is Mark chapter 8, and this is starting in verse 31. Jesus talking with his disciples, with his 12 closest friends. says, Then Jesus began to tell them, the disciples, that the Son of Man, that was a title given to Jesus, the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders and the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later, he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him by saying such things. Never a good idea to reprimand Jesus, by the way. Um, Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples, then reprimanded uh, Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. Catch this. You were seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. And the greater context is, then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your, to your life, you will lose it. 
But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what you do, and, and, and what you do, you, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? And then he concludes this conversation with the crowd, if anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. In this passage, in these verses, in Mark chapter 8, Jesus actually gives us the core of unmet expectations. And here it is. It's in your note sheet. At the core of our unmet expectations lurks an inaccurate definition of success. At the core of our unmet expectations lurks an inaccurate definition of success. Over this handful of verses, Jesus not only redefines, but he re properly defines success for us. And in these verses, he does it in four ways. Number one, success is not defined by a lack of suffering. Success is not defined by a lack of suffering. Now, the apostle Peter, when Jesus is telling his friends, the, the, the disciples go, hey, listen, I gotta tell you, it's coming up on the time to where I'm gonna be arrested, I'm gonna be taken into custody, I'm gonna be beat, I'm gonna be crucified on the cross, but I'm gonna rise from the dead. The apostle Peter never fathomed that, that the Son of God, that the way to glory was actually through suffering. So that's why Peter goes, hey, Jesus, you need to calm down that talk like you're kind of freaking people out. And then Jesus turned and looked at him and said, you're thinking from a human point of view, not from God's. See, like us, I think he wrongly defined that there's no way that Jesus' success could actually involve pain and suffering. Isn't that true for us too, that we think that there's no way that in heaven's economy, in God's economy, that success could actually involve pain and suffering? Now, I'm not trying to sound hyper-spiritual and go, okay, we're going to get you to sign a, a connect card and go, hey, God, sign me up for more pain and suffering. I think that's really weird. <laughs> I never met anybody that said, hey, God, more pain, more suffering, all three. Thank you, please. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about having a proper perspective and framework of success and pain as it pertains to pain and suffering. Now, I don't know about you, but I will do anything and almost everything to avoid pain. I, let me give you a quick example. I hate, I mean, absolutely hate needles. Like the thought of getting a shot and the thought of having my blood drawn makes me makes my hands sweat like they're starting to get like amphibious right now. It makes them sweat and I start to get like squirmy. I hate giving blood or getting a shot. Which presented a quandary right before Julie and I got married. You see, way back in the day, not too far back in the day, but back in the day, back in the day, it was Georgia state law that you had to have a blood test before they gave you a marriage license. It's not that case anymore because I guess the state of Georgia goes, hey, if you're first cousins, that's your business. Good luck to you. <laughs> I tried everything to get out of this blood test. I tried everything. But you know what? Apparently, a $20 bribe wasn't as enticing as I thought it was going to be. And eventually, love won the day, and I gave my blood, and we've been married. But I will, get, I will do almost anything to avoid pain. But isn't it strange how we will do almost anything to avoid temporary pain, even though we know that it's going to bring about prolonged healing? I think the best example of this is the cross of Jesus. I really do. The cross is the ultimate example of this truth. There is no one that denies the gruesomeness of the cross and crucifixion. As a matter of fact, the crucifixion, the word excruciating, the English word excruciating is where we get, uh, where the word came from when we start looking at the gruesome nature of crucifixion and the cross. And Jesus never hyper-spiritualized, like, hey, this is what I got to do. You got to do what you got to do. He actually even anguished over the coming pain and the crucifixion in the Garden of Gethsemane 
the night before the night that he was arrested, so much so that he burst the blood vessels in his forehead and began to sweat drops of blood. That's hard, hardcore stress. Yet without the cross, our sins could never be forgiven. Without the cross, we'd all be destined to be separated from God when we die in a very real, very horrible place called hell. The pain and shame of the cross was nothing compared to what the cross accomplished. I think intellectually we get this. The problem comes when emotionally we begin to think about pain and suffering as being automatic signs of God's disfavor towards us. God, why am I going through this? Where did I take the wrong turn? And the answer may very well be, you're going through this because this is what I need to lead you through. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm always with you, even in the darkest valleys, even in the valley of the shadow of death. I'll never leave you. But in order to grow you, in order to develop you into who I created you to be, I need to guide you through this season. So many times because we're so pain adverse, we sit there and we wrongly assume that if we're going through something hard, it means that we're out of disfavor with God. That's why it's so easy for us to wrongly believe that, if, uh, that a life of success is marked by a lack of suffering. So the pain and suffering, when they come our way, and it's not if, but when, when pain and suffering come our way, I think our first instinct should be to look to the cross of Jesus, to the empty tomb of Jesus, and not our feeds. Because the empty tomb of Jesus, the cross of Jesus, gives us a proper context of success. Second way that Jesus rightly defines success, success is not defined by living out your dreams. Success is not defined by living out your dreams. Jesus went on to say, said, that if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, follow me. If you try to hang on to your own life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and the, and the gospel, the kingdom, then you'll gain it. His teachings to those who followed him, it was a tough, tough choice that he gave them. Basically, this is the choice that Jesus laid out to them. Path one, your dreams, follow your heart, follow your plan for you, knowing that that's probably going to be the easiest and the most convenient path. However, that path is going to lead to shallowness. That path is going to lead to hopelessness. That path is going to lead to you questioning your very significance. And oh, by the way, you're still going to be carrying around the guilt and the shame of your sins because you're going to be disconnected from your creator. Path number two, you take up my way, you lay down your way, knowing that it's going to be the hard way, the most difficult way, yet on this path, you're going to find fulfillment. You're going to find hope. You're going to find peace. You're going to find significance and, oh, by the way, you will have your sins forgiven. You will be free of guilt and shame, and you'll be right with the Father. Those are the choices. Those are the choices. Now, that directly pushes back against our Americanized version of Christianity, and this is what I mean, is so often we fall for the lie, just follow your dreams. Just live out your dreams. And here's what we do. We don't say this out loud, but this is how like Americanized Christianity has functioned for decades. This is not new. This is decades. Just follow your dreams, follow your hearts, bring Jesus along for the ride. If you make it big, give a shout out to Jesus and you get extra points. Jesus tells us in order to follow him, we must give up our own way and exchange it for his. Here's our problem, is we want to have a foot in both worlds, don't we? We want to follow certain teachings of Jesus, those that are directly beneficial to us, while also following our hopes and dreams. And to say it bluntly, we have to choose. Do we really want to follow Jesus in totality, or do we just want to uh, keep trying to use Jesus to sprinkle on some blessing dust on what we want to do in our, over our own endeavors? In our culture, success is defined by following your heart and living out your dream. In God's view, success is defined by you living in alignment with his will. This is getting at the very core, deep, deep at the core of this elephant of unmet expectation. So the two ways that he defines that success is not, he pivots and he begins to define that success is. Success is defined by the health of your soul. 
Success is defined by the health of your soul. He says this when he asks the question, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world yet lose your soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul? Now, when the world measures success, what do they typically, what is the typical metric of that success? It's usually our bank accounts, isn't it? Or something directly tied to our bank accounts. There's absolutely nothing wrong with money. There's absolutely nothing wrong with wealth. As a matter of fact, I would encourage you to go back through and listen back through Pastor Joe's message in the fourth week of this series, talking about stewardship. Incredible, incredible message there. But there is a lot wrong, however, with neglecting the health of our soul at the expense of a pursuit of making more money. No one, and I know that we've said this and it sounds so cliche, no one in here will be able to take any of our financial earnings with us after we die. Our soul, however, lives forever. So you want to talk about investment, wise investment, Invest in the thing that is going to live forever, not the thing that is temporary. So the question begins to pivot. The questions begin to shift from how much money am I making to how much money do I have in savings to what is my job title? Those questions begin to shift and pivot to now what brings health to my soul? What brings health to my soul? Because success as Jesus defined it involves a healthy soul. And the fourth way that he properly, rightly defines and redefines success for us is uh, success is defined by right standing before God. I told uh, our student ministry a couple weeks ago, uh, I was speaking with them, and I made the comment, and it, it may sound overly simplistic, but it's so true. If you're good with God, you're good. If you're good with God, you're good. Here's what I mean. The fact that we will all one day die and stand before God and as Romans 14, 12 states, give a personal account to God for the way in which we lived and the time that he gave us to live. That's not meant to scare us. That's meant to shift our perspective from the temporal to the eternal. We rightfully give a lot of attention to how we're viewed by the people around us. And guess what? We should. You should care. I should care about how I'm viewed by my, by my wife and by my kids. We should care how we're viewed by our boss and our coworker. We should care how we're viewed by our friends and by our neighbors. You know why? Because it's really hard, if not impossible, to reach people with the gospel of Jesus while we act like a jerk. We should rightfully care about those things. But our objective should not be about image projection or projecting a certain image to people. Our objective should be living in right standing before God in personal holiness and allow that holiness to overflow out of us onto the people around us. So this this reframing and redefining of success by Jesus means that there is a daily, if not uh, moment by moment, process of freeing this elephant, and I would say even evicting this elephant from our lives. So very briefly, let me go through this, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you, it is absolutely amazing how Scripture actually fills in the blanks for us. And here's what I mean, just summarizing three key phrases that we went through into one word apiece. Number one, it's going to always start with surrender. So Jesus says, give up your own way. This is going to be a daily, if not moment by moment, commitment that we make. Jesus, I need to surrender my life to you. If you're already a follower of Jesus, it starts every morning. If you're not a follower of Jesus, it can start this morning. Um, And we'll give you an opportunity. We'll walk you through that in just a moment. But freeing the elephant involves surrender, giving up your own way. Here's what I mean. None of us default to godliness. None of us naturally drift towards holiness. So the best way to surrender our lives each and every day is to wake up with two realizations. I have a plan for me today, and God has a plan for me today. Now you have a decision to make. Are you going to surrender your plan for you for God's plan for you? That's what it means when Jesus says, give up your own way. Giving up your own way means that you choose to surrender to God's plan for you today. The second step is pursue, is pursue. Just because you wake up in the morning and you go, God, I have a way for me, you have a way for me, I choose your way for me, does not mean that you won't be tempted to take control back of your life throughout the day. Think of it this way. Each decision that you face 
is a choice that you make. So before making the call, before making the decision, before making the choice, simply push pause, time out, step back, and ask yourself these questions. What decision would I normally make in this situation? How would I normally make this decision? And then what decision would be consistent with me following God's plan for me? What, what, how would I normally make this decision? And then if I'm really wanting to follow God's plan for me, how would I make the decision if I want to stay consistent with that? That's pursuit. Taking up your cross means that you're constantly dying to self so that you can live for God. And then this third step is a day-by-day, moment-by-moment, it's filter. It's filter. One of the most common phrases that Jesus used in the New Testament, in the Gospels, is this two-word phrase, follow me. Man, it's so packed of what that means. Follow me. But for our purposes, looking at this elephant, wanting to rid ourselves of this elephant in our lives, we have to acknowledge that Satan wants nothing more than the elephant of unmet expectations to survive and thrive in your life. And if this elephant survives and thrives, guess what gets destroyed? You and your family. So here's Satan's tactics. He knows where you're weak. He knows where you're vulnerable. There are tailor-made attacks, specific attacks that are gonna come against you that's gonna trigger this elephant in your life. And because we are all different, we have different backgrounds, we have different strengths, we have different weaknesses, we have different struggles, our struggles or or, or those attacks are gonna be varied. They're gonna be different. But you wanna get like really personal for some of us because social media gives this elephant a foothold in your life. Guess what? The best thing, the most godly thing, the holiest thing that you can do is to disconnect from social media. Hit the app long press, hit the X at the top. And then when it gives you the option, move off your home screen or delete the app, just delete the app. Why would we do that? Because we're trying to be legalistic and prove ourselves as holier than everybody else? No, but because we take so seriously, we don't want this elephant to gain a foothold in our lives. That's not gonna be, that, that, that's not the call for everybody, but that's gonna be the call for some. For others, It may be because you have some unhealthy relationships in your life that are causing you to go back and relive regrets or to uh, continue being victimized. You need to go through the soul-searching process of rearranging the hierarchy of who you allow to speak into your life at what depths. That's tough. And because we're so different, I don't know everybody's makeup, I don't know everybody's background, everybody's experience, but guess what the Holy Spirit does? God knows. So our, what is going to cause us to filter, what, how I filter day by day, moment by moment, is going to look different from how you filter. And how you filter is going to look maybe different than how I filter. The point is, is we actively filter what we allow to directly impact us and influence us. When Jesus says, follow me, he's inviting you into a life of fullness and significance. But in order to live new life, guess what? You've got to disconnect from old life, old living. So I want to walk you through. We never want to lay out God's word for you without giving you a a, a chance and a time and space to respond to how the Holy Spirit may be moving in your life. But to kind of bring a little bit more clarity of how the Holy Spirit is moving in your life, I want to walk you through some key questions, some response questions this morning. You don't have to write anything down. You don't have to raise your hand. But how have my, ask yourself, how have my unmet expectations robbed me and the people around me of joy? If I acknowledge that this elephant exists in my life, guess what? This elephant isn't just confined to some back room in your life. It's impacting you. And if it's impacting you, it's impacting the people around you. So how have my unmet expectations robbed me and the people around me of joy? Number two, How are my definitions of success different from Jesus' definitions of success? That's a tough one. And let me kind of further unpack that. If I understand that there is a difference in in definitions, 
What do I need to surrender? So in other words, like, are you just going through the motions? You sit there and go, yeah, I said a prayer back when I was in youth group. So I'm good with God. I've surrendered my life to God. Like, I get that. Like, you, you've, you, you've, you've gone from the starting line, but where are you in the race here? You see, surrender is a day-by-day, moment-by-moment thing with God. God, I have a plan for me. You have a plan for me. God, I choose your plan for me. What do I need to surrender? Also, what do I need to pursue? What do I need to pursue in my life? In other words, to take up my cross and to follow Jesus. What do I need to pursue? And then number three, what do I need to filter? This is what's gonna give like the real handles to the change that the Holy Spirit wants to bring into your life. So here's what I wanna do. Our band's about to come out. I wanna simply spend this time praying over us. And if there's anything in your life that you need to lay down at the feet of Jesus, anything that you need to say, hey, there is an elephant in my life, there's an elephant in my family, I need it gone. If you've picked up anything over these past five weeks and this morning, don't miss this truth. You and I are not good enough, strong enough, or powerful enough to rid ourselves of this elephant on our own. If we were, it'd already be gone by now. But guess who is? God. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to work in your life and to bring freedom into your life. But guess what? He's not going to force freedom on you. So if you want to come down at these steps and pray and go, God, I need you to set me free. God, I need you to give me the courage and the boldness to take this step of filtering in my life. God, I acknowledge that you have a plan for me and I have a plan for me. And God, I've been living out my plan for me. I want to start living out your plan for me. If you want to pray at these steps, you can pray at these steps. If you want to pray for me, I'll be down front. I would love to pray with you. If you want to pray at your seats. And can I tell you, it's really scary when we get vulnerable at a very core level. So I love the fact that our band, they're about to sing over us and we can join them in praise. God, you are faithful. You've never brought us this far just to leave us. Great is your faithfulness. God, your promises never fail us. We can trust you. You know us. You have good for us. But God, you also never force us to accept your good for us. So let me pray. God, we thank you for you being God over it all. God, you know us inside and out. You know the parts that we try to hide from you. And yet you choose to love us. God, there's nothing in our lives that you don't know and there's no part of us that we have to prove ourselves to you. God, every single person in this room this morning and worshiping with us online, God, you have a plan for us. You have a plan for our good. But God, it's amazing how we allow the elephants in our lives to block our view of you and what you have for our lives. So God, maybe for the first time, maybe for the first time in a long time, God, we throw up our hands and surrender and we admit that there's nothing that we can do to kick this elephant, to evict this elephant from our lives. God, in the name of Jesus, we call on you to just absolutely clean our house this morning, to clean our hearts, to clean our souls, to bring help. So God, I pray that you would bring us to that moment of surrender. God, give us the courage and the boldness and the obedience to take whatever step you're calling us to take this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.